if you're over leveraged, if you bought pre-construction with the intent to assign and sell at a profit, and now you realize you can't and you have to close on it, you have to watch this video. I'm talking to one of the best real estate lawyers here in the city of Toronto. We talk about what's happening in the assignment market, the risks and what you should be doing. And also for those of you sitting on the sidelines with cash, we also talk about when the deals are going to start showing up. I highly suggest you stick around to watch this. Very informative. Hi, my name is Vass and I'm a chartered professional accountant by training. However, I am a full-time real estate broker right here in the GTA and I help people navigate through the insanity that we call the Toronto real estate market. All right, so there's been a lot of chatter on the internet from Reddit, Twitter, Facebook groups. There's a lot of assignment sales coming up for sale. A lot of people are not selling them. They're still expecting profit, yet they're saying that they're distressed sellers. So there's a lot of price discovery happening and a lot of realtors don't know how to actually sell an assignment. You're dealing with two negotiations, one with the builder, one with the buyer, and then there's the managing of the expectations of the seller. So it's not an easy process, one that very few understand. So we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk to one of the best, Mark Morris, and he's going to walk us through what he's seeing and what, what he thinks is going to happen with the space. Um, Enjoy. Let's start by... Uh, so first, I'm going to do a quick intro on you because I think this is important. I want to give sure. people context, okay? So... In, my, in the last 10 years, I've worked with all kinds of lawyers, from corporate lawyers, litigation lawyers, and mostly real estate lawyers, obviously. And uh, what I've learned in that process is that if you let a lawyer hijack a deal, you're never going to get a deal done. Now, and the reason I say this is because as a lawyer, you have risk mitigation, but then there's the business side of getting a deal done. And the reason we're talking is I find that you're one of the few that I have found or have come across that understands that. Yes, you have to risk mitigate, but at the same time, there's a business or a deal that we have to solve for. And I think that's mostly because you have an entrepreneurial streak in you and you understand and you can modulate between these two things. So I just want to make sure that people understand why we're talking and personally why I value your opinion, especially when it comes to all the different things that are unfolding in real estate. So that being out of the way, um, the reason I'm talking to you is our mutual friend Jordan from precondo.ca. Uh, made a post recently, and he's been talking about it for a while, that his inbound on assignment sales and people not being able to close on pre-construction condos has gone up. So people are trying to figure out what to do, and they can't close for a variety of reasons. So I know you've already talked about people not being able to close on purchases that they made earlier this year because prices have gone down, appraisals, appraisals have come in light. How are you, let's talk about, I guess, assignments. How is what's happened up until this point translating into the assignment space? And have you seen anything on the assignment end yet? Yeah, so there, there's actually quite a bit to say. First off, thanks for the kind words. Um, and I would tell you, yes, the job of a lawyer is always to kind of be an anchor. Uh, it's, always, it's always comical to me, by the way, when a lawyer is sitting around the boardroom table and thinking that they're actually making decisions, when everyone else is kind of staring at them going, we hate you so much, just let us go forward with this deal. Um, because again, as you, as you properly highlight, the job of a lawyer is to you know, quantify risk. Um, and, and doing so is a bit of an art, particularly when you need deals to actually proceed forward. Uh, but to your point, to your question, let's talk about that. The assignment market. The assignment market is in huge flux. Um, for a large part of uh, the past several months, uh, there's been almost illiquidity in the market. That is to say, the, ha there has been a serious lack of buyers for product. And that really wasn't, didn't put the strain on people the way you would think, because it happily coincided with a builder's strike in Ontario. Uh, which meant that there was less product just plain entering into the market. It so happens that because of construction costs and uh, because builders were given a get out of jail free card where they could basically email everyone and say, hey, we have this construction strike. Um, actually, significantly less product hit the market at the very time that there was an illiquidity event. It was like just this happenstance of good fortune. And so a lot of people have become very, very worried, but very few people have had to go through their test of fire. That is to say the completion of buildings. That is now changing. As you may imagine, the building strike having been put behind us, we have people who are in quite a desperate state. The desperation stems from several sources. First, it stems from the fact that they have inappropriately borrowed for these condos. Uh, let's put aside fraud, let's put aside everything else which we can talk about in a minute. Um, the simple fact is that the money that they had to put down as a deposit, 20% is real. And almost everyone did it because, frankly, money was free in the past five years. Um, in fact, we had this ridiculous circumstance where, for the first time in Canadian history, 
people earn more by holding onto a house than they did by working. Uh, something was seriously askew. And the way, what they did with that was they refinanced the hell out of their primary assets and put, pumped it back into the only vehicle that an average Canadian can really make exceptional returns on, the vehicle that actually allows you to borrow at government rates, real estate. And better than even borrowing at government rates is a futures contract that allows you to benefit from the rising increase of uh, a pre-construction project payable only in five years when you only have to put 20% down. And that 20% down largely came from vehicles like HELOCs registered against their homes. HELOCs were fine so long as interest rates remain stable and at 2%, but that has significantly changed. The feature that I think most people and perhaps many of your listeners don't fully appreciate unless they're in this circumstance is exactly how close to the wire people play things all the time. I don't blame them. I have two kids, private school to pay for, God knows what. It is expensive going through life. But what people fail to really appreciate is exactly how close to insolvency most people actually are on a given day. And that insolvency means that variations in cash flow have significant effects. Not that you have to give up your cafe lattes, and it's not that you have to give up your avocado toasts. It's that you plain cannot afford things. And whereas most people, even those people who have a little bit of a reserve can probably sustain change for a period of a month, two months, three months, four months, as we approach five, six, seven months, things change. The variable feature that has changed immediately is that HELOC prices have gone up and the pain has started. What is going to cause the maximalist pain is the thing that most people are not really contemplating. Uh, you know, if you if you look through real estate Twitter, you'll see all this stuff about trigger rates and God knows what, and all of that is real. That that's the acute pain that people are facing. But the real pain people are facing is the fact that interest rates are going to be long and harsh over time. It's the time that's a killer, because you know it's like going and holding your head underwater. For the first ten seconds, you're fine. It's at the 30 second mark that you're like, well, I'm in trouble. And it's at the 60 second mark that, you know, you start looking up, you know, what looks good on an obituary. That's the longer that you are held, have your held, head held underwater, the more pain you feel until eventually you cannot feel it anymore and you're done. That's where we are. Now, to some degree in the assignment market, I'm sorry, I'm speaking a lot here, but to some degree in the assignment market, the pain also has an acute inflection point at the time when a transaction concludes. So you have the building pain that happens with the HELOC, which sustained over time becomes untenable for a lot of people, forcing people into an assignment uh, position. But then you also have all those people who are forced into closing positions and have no chance of actually closing because they have purchased and bought way more than they actually have been able to afford, even in the best of times. And they did so on the understanding that real estate only goes up and that they would be able to assign their way out of any problem. So <clears throat> let's, this is very, okay, so this is exactly, thank you for this, uh, very helpful. The part I try to do it, and you nailed it earlier, is I try to quantify the risk. So I'm, one thing is to quantify on the macro side. I'll leave that for people that get paid a lot more than me. I'm trying to figure it out on the micro side, because I do know people that actually are holding on to paper. They've bought pre-cons. They don't think they're going to be able to close on them, especially now. And the question, at least I'm trying to solve in my head, is what are the real options? And as I see it right now, there are two options. If you're closing in the next 6 to 12 months, chances are you're not underwater on the unit you're holding. Hopefully, you can break even after fees, HST, whatever the case may be. You can hopefully break even, walk away. So let's assume those people are going to be fine. But there are also people who are going to be underwater possibly beyond their deposit money. And I'm just making a speculation uh, assumption here. So my question is, do I sell now and materialize the real loss today and have a clean cut and try to sell this assignment, assuming I can sell it? Or do I kick the can down the road, wait until I can't close and then deal with the fallout of what happens with the builder? And this is what I'm trying to understand with these two options. And if there's option three or something, or if I have. Yeah, well, there, there actually are quite a few of other options. So let's, let's okay. go into, you're asking a really interesting question. So first, um, there are the people who are ready to crystallize a loss. Those people are far few and in between. There are very few people who willingly walk on holes. There just right. are. 
pushing it off and hoping that something changes is the way of humanity. It's the way that things are going to proceed. Now, to some degree, you may be pushed onto the coals by the HELOC matter that we just talked about, but, but the likelihood is people are going to hold on until push comes to shove. When push comes to shove, I think, and this is purely speculation, but I'm seeing it start to build. I think that, it, there, that it's going to come down to a classic real estate gambit of location, 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 because everyone is in for approximately 20%. My guess is that smart money will start accumulating, ready to buy out assignments in urban areas if you are prepared to take your loss. That is to say, we'll avoid the lawsuit. Go ahead, 20% in our pocket. We'll take over your project. You have no issue. My guess is that there are, because there are massive pools of capital that are staying out there. And what we're doing is we're saying, hey, there's a collective barrel of fish out there, all of whom have 20% down on condos that were valued in 2018, 2019 in heavily urban areas where builders have stopped building and where there's a price floor to construction. Well, all of those things are saying to smart money, hey, we should assemble capital pools and go in. So my guess is that for the main, provided you bought locations that make sense, meaning condo products in the downtown core, the maximal amount that most people will lose is the extent of their deposit because I suspect that when things get started and start going downhill, vultures will step in and take advantage of the situation. There is no hope. The people who are going to be hopeless are the people who bought the freeholds in Caledon and Stouffville. And I, 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 Vessel, I'm sorry about this. Where, where are you located? I, I should ask. <laughs> I'm based out of Markham. Markham, You're Richmond Mark Hill. Markham. Yeah. Markham. There. Markham, the Stouffville's, the, the, the Caledon's. The, if you bought your $2 million property in Markham, good luck to you. Because even with your 20%, the values have fallen beyond that. And they're single detached. And they aren't like baskets. It's not as appealing. And in those questions, then, then your question then is maintained. Well, what happens there? What happens on the periphery? So my guess is that they will hold out until push comes to shove. And then at that point, the job of a lawyer is really to negotiate the end game. Now, to some degree, the job of a lawyer is made easier if, in fact, there's still quite a few months before close. The reason for that is because if the builder can push you to close, the builder already has your deposits and the builder can seize those deposits. And as a result, there's no incentive that the builder has at that point to give you a mutual release because they already have the thing that you can offer, which is the mutual, which is your deposits. Whereas if you approach them six months before close and say, listen, I'm having trouble coming to the table with closing money. I suspect we're going to have an issue. I'll give you this six month lead time, sign my mutual release and let me out of the deal. They may very well at that point say, yeah, we're good with that. We, we, may, we may agree. Now, of course, the soft story that you tell the builder matters. You have to actually express the hardship and explain to them in not uncertain terms that there really is nothing that they can do if they actually go to court to see the money. I'll give you an example. Uh, I've had two people who have tried to negotiate out of their agreements in the past week. One of them had cancer, bona fide. Uh, expected to pass the next year. Builder said, yeah, you're good. You're out. Here's, we gave them the doctor's notes and everything else. Another person said, look, <laughs> I'm a foreign resident. I have no issues here. I don't have any money and I'm going back to Iran. Thank you very much. Will you please accept this? And I showed the builder that, you know, suing him would net nothing anyways. Let's just have walk away clean hands. And the builder said, yes, we'll accept the deposit. So there is negotiation to be had, but the be all and end all is, that negotiation has to take place well in advance of closing, because if you hit to closing, the builder already has what they want, and then will probably preserve their right to sue you, um, because the law in Ontario is you are not only on the hook for your deposits, but you're also on the hook for the delta between what it is you've agreed to contract for and what the builder can resell for. So is it fair to assume, just again, from layman's terms, because I've never been in a situation like this, I think many of us, for many of us, this is going to be very new. So... As you said, human nature, I'm not going to want to crystallize the loss. I'm going to kick the can down the road, and then I'm going to deal with the builder, say, six to three months prior to closing if I'm smart. So the reason I'm asking or trying to confirm this is people think we're going to have all these dis distressed assignments coming up for sale, 
and everything I'm seeing that's quote unquote distressed is not distressed. And when you try to negotiate to try to actually pick something up for a good deal, it generally goes nowhere. And I think it's because of this phenomenon, because they have this option B. And I think everybody's waiting to just kick the can down the road or miraculously, maybe values are going to come back by the time they have to close, whatever the case may be. That's the reason why people are not negotiating yet. I think the reason I've seen a lot of interesting commentaries that sellers are basically saying reduce your price and buyers are basically saying still pointing to February, right? Like there is not yet a realization that has set into our industry generally and the general public that in high interest rates are here to stay. There just yep. isn't. It, it's funny you mentioned that. I see this on the resale side. I, I, re- I have two listing clients right now and both are opting out to just not sell. They're going to wait until spring because they think prices are going to be higher uh, next spring and whatever the case may be. And everybody's entitled to their opinion. And in, they, in, in their case, they're okay to do that because they have small mortgages. They don't care. They don't need to actually do anything. But it's these pre-construction slash assignment people. They don't really have options, right? Like they are heading for the cliff. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And remember, a lot of the people who are in the resale market also have are, are also able to maintain their high and mightiness by basically saying, I'll just rent it and rising rents mean that, you know, that makes increasing sense every single time. Uh, so to some degree, you know, there is a bit of an offset that, that exists in the rental market, which doesn't really exist in the new build market, because even though you can rent, you are still dealing with uh, properties that fundamentally um, are not, were not really purchased on the basis of any sort of pro forma that makes sense based on where rents are for a two bedroom condo. Um, so yes, they're gonna be pushed over the cliff. And I think part of the reason that we haven't seen that take place is because the volume of product that is going to hit is going to hit, I think in February. This is after all supply demand. There will be desperation amongst the subset might be a large subset, might be a small subset, but a subset. And that desperation has not yet been realized with, in, in accordance with massive oversupply. Right now, it's been realized in tandem with an illiquid market, but not massive oversupply. There's not an abundance. Of, oh, God, let me, like, everywhere you look, there's someone who's trying to sell one of these things. But that's yeah. coming. That's coming as these projects come online and as the interest rates stay high. And once it sets in, once the mentality sets in that this is the new reality for years, that's when desperation sets in. Because people will always be able to sustain one more month, but they can't sustain one more year. Okay. So this is actually, this is a great segue. So I think we've answered, if you're a person that has an assignment that you cannot close on, we know what, what you should be doing and how you should be going about it. Now let's flip it as let's say, I want to take opportunity of what's going to happen. And what you just said, February, we need to have inventory, right? And we currently don't have this inventory. So timing aside, um, one question I saw somebody mention on Twitter that I thought it was a good question. What if I am an end user in a building that was overbought by speculators, which, you know what I mean? We know certain, I I personally know some projects are more overbought by investors, let's call them speculators. And then there's end user boutique buildings, which don't have as much of this risk as the other ones. What what do, do you see any other risk for the people that are actually planning to close and live in these buildings? Like, how do you see that? playing out. Yeah, totally. You, you know, when you do a status certificate review, actually, there's a line that most people never really understand, which is how many rental units there are. In fact, some lawyers don't even report on it. I report on it every time. Uh, and not only do I report on it to my clients, I also make it contextualized. I basically say it's this many units are rented of this many units. So you actually understand the percentage. You may wonder why that's there. You know, if you ask the average person, why is that there? The, their answer is very simple. They're like, well, because people care less about rented units. So you can expect a better quality product. And that may be the case, may not be, who, who cares? That's not the reason it's there. The reason it's there, Russell, is because when Mark Morris owns a property and Mark Morris owns an income property and Mark Morris runs into financial difficulty and one of the properties that Mark Morris owns contains his beautiful young children and they're and very close to the school that they attend. And the other one contains some renter that they do not, that Mark Morris does not care about. When Mark Morris runs into financial difficulty, which of those two products does he more likely to sell at a loss? And as a result, what you're talking about in the rental amounts is the susceptibility to market change. 
Now, strangely, there's actually a corollary, which is that rental product actually also goes up faster. So it goes down faster, but it goes up faster. It's more susceptible to market change on both ends. But we are currently in a downward facing market. And so what we need to understand is that if you have more investor product, you're more likely to see people who are in distress because these are secondary homes for people and the secondary homes go before the first. And as a result, a smart end user may, who's buying in these areas may ver and who can say a sign and has an out may very well choose to do that. May choose to sit on a rent and buy boutique product because boutique product, what that is, is it's kind of a hedge against downturn. Whereas um, the proper way to capitalize on uptick is by purchasing something which is heavily rented. It's, it's a facet that not many real estate agents kind of think about, but is true, is born out of the data. Yeah, that's that's a solid point for me. The, the least unit ratio versus end user ratio is one of the most critical things when I look at condos personally for myself or clients, because you see it in the building. It, one thing is a status certificate. One thing is to walk the place. So I think to articulate what you just said, if I'm an end user and I bought in a place that's oversubscribed by speculators and investors, I'm assuming I'm not going to be able to get out of my assignment. I'm going to close on it. But what you're telling me is that I'm most likely going to deal with a lot of downward price pressure on my unit because it's filled with so many speculators who are likely going to be it's more, more likely. likely that that building will experience downward price pressure. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I agree with that. Okay. Well, I think I think that pretty much that sums it up. I think from my end, I think you've answered quite a bit of uh, my questions, and I think from my end, it's going to be a wait and see. Personally, like you said earlier, trigger rates. I mean, we've all been hit by trigger rates, but at the end of the day, like the trigger rate, I think one more rate hike, and we're going to hit most trigger rates. But then your payment just goes up by a couple hundred bucks, whatever the case may be. So I don't think that's going to create much of an issue with this assignment market. I guess the way I'm looking at it is. And I'm not a bull. I'm just trying to be rational. If you have put 20% down, there's an absorption of 20% to modulate on the price. So yes, a lot of people are going to be hurt, but that's going to be individuals that are going to be hurt. I don't see how there's going to be a widespread impact to the entire real estate market. But again, you never know, right? You don't know what's going to do to sentiment or how builders are going to react. So for me, it's very interesting to hear different perspectives and just to understand what is going to break the real estate market here. That's that's why I wanted to talk to you. So this was very. I, I, I totally I subscribe to much of what you're saying. I think just just to sum up and bring it back, what's going to break the real estate market is not higher interest rates, but longer high interest rates. And and I think, like, not to scare people, but I think you're looking at this is not something that comes down next year or the year after or even the year after that. I'm thinking that you are going to be at rates of four five percent on a fixed five year for many years, three, four years at least. This is predicated upon bond markets. These don't move quickly. And, and once people internalize that, then the blood flows because it's a wound. It, 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 it's, it's actually a good analogy. You know, like if you're bleeding heavily in the first minute, you're fine, but eventually it catches up to you and then you faint and eventually you die. So we got it. Wow, I've been full of analogies today. So we, we, we you know, that, that's, that's where I think the, the real estate market starts creaking and turning down. But it's going to be interesting to see what happens with the assignments. And I thank you very much for inviting me on the show. I really appreciate it and look forward to uh, chatting again.